I'm Adam Hurst-Goronitas. I am a filmmaker and multimedia artist based currently in Los Angeles, California. And my name is Brendan Hall. Uh, I'm a filmmaker and photographer. I work mostly as a documentary and commercial director, but I'm also a cinematographer and editor. Um, I think like Adam, kind of wear a lot of different hats, which it sounds like you do too. Yeah, let's go for it. Uh, what questions do you have? And I can't wait to ask you some too, so. So uh, let's let's jump into talking about your film, um, your portrait of, of Maggie Rogers back in my body. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about how you got interested uh, in, in her and, and this as a subject matter that you then pursued and went all the way to Alaska to shoot? One of my best friends in college, Fraser Jones, um, was on tour with her, uh, filming, shooting photos. And both of us have been friends with Maggie for years in college. And we just kind of had this idea where we thought that it'd be amazing if she would ever go back to Alaska because um, her kind of big breakout song was called Alaska. Um, we kind of wondered how amazing it would be to capture her in that natural environment uh, and in the outdoors, reconnecting with that song and connecting with what it really meant. And I was just really interested in the idea of someone achieving such quick and explosive fame and then all of a sudden being given kind of a unique amount of space to, to reckon with that and start feeling that. Um, and we just got really fortunate. The, the last two dates of her shows that year ended up being in Alaska. Um, and so we talked to her about it. She was really down. And then we created a pitch deck and pitched it to her management. And they were kind enough to give us um, an amount of funding that was just enough to kind of like rent cars and fly out there. Yeah, did you have any kind of um, specific philosophy going into the project about how you wanted to depict this visually? Yeah, I think it just worked well because me, I came from a background going into the film of doing a lot of nature-based filmmaking in, in films in the outdoors. And so I was really big on the idea of capturing someone in nature and how the landscape around them affects their story. And so that kind of lended to some of the big sweeping visuals, bringing her to some of the scenic spots. And then Frazier, uh, who co-directed the film with me, he had been on tour with her and he had done a lot of music filmmaking as well as doc filmmaking. And so I think that kind of like, you know, raw, nostalgic and kind of really vulnerable feel, some of the moments um, really came from him creating that space. And so, and I think a big decision I had to make personally was not to bring a gimbal on the trip um, mm -hmm. as doing nature stuff and wanting to get those big sweeping landscapes I've done a ton of gimbal work and especially coming from the branded world, it was so like clean, uh, clean and sweeping. But so I kind of had to like bite my tongue and just say, it's best to leave it at home. This should be a bit more raw, more personable. And we'll use a drone to get some of kind of that bigger nature stuff. And I'd love to hear about your project, Scaling Iceland. I mean, let's let's go right into Arctic and surreal landscapes. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to just yeah. hear like about how you conceptualize some of the film. I think it's so unique the blend of different voices, the very distinct visual style with the aerials and kind of playing with that sense of scale. The the seed of the idea came from a little bit of a like, a, like a stretch of a visual metaphor. I was studying neuroscience in undergraduate and I, uh, through some of my classes, just became acquainted with uh, genetic mapping. And so looking at different uh, genome mapping patterns I it's just it's often they're just rings and they have these like little nodes on them and then I also happen to be uh, reading up on Iceland and how they they proclaim to be the sort of ideal place to conduct uh, genetic testing or, or genome mapping because of the perceived homogeneity of their population so I was like okay this is an interesting case study of like we have this very supposedly homogeneous population in this incredibly dramatic landscape where they have to be in commune with nature at all times because it can just, you know, it can rock their world at any moment, literally from just the harsh winters, but also volcanic activity. While I was doing this research, that was more tailored towards um, brain development and genes. I saw that the, <laughs> I saw that the maps of Iceland that I had been sort of like looking at in a daydream about like, oh, one day I'll get to visit Iceland. I was like, oh yeah, the ring road that goes around this country kind of looks like the maps that we use for genome sequencing. Like, it's just a ring. It's got these little nodes popped around it. 
how interesting would it be to sort of try to blend what is like the sort of macroscopic scale with this really microscopic scale? I think that interplay between science and nature, um, that's incredible, man. Uh, I, one of my questions has to do with something that Maggie Rogers said in your piece. She said, it's her job to see the world and report back. It's her job to feel things fiercely and to be present. I, I really loved how she framed that role, like the role of an artist and how that, that mentality translates to pretty much any medium and whether you also feel that with, with your own with your own work, how, how do you how do you normally like decide? Okay, you know this is this is what I want to like invest this time and, and attention in. What I think back to is first what you said is the curiosity element of I need to chase something that I'm curious about and that I really believe in, and that for, for my films, especially since it's doc and there's this element of adventure and reality and going into an environment or into a situation with someone. I think I'm like focused on that experience and how I'm learning through the process. I had a, I had someone tell me once that he's like, you you make your best films while you're learning. And I love that and it's so true. And I think it's just because first it comes from chasing that curiosity of why am I so passionate about this? What do I wanna know about this person? Like I really wanna dig out this story or bring this person into this environment and see how it affects them. I think that curiosity and that like fervor comes through the filmmaking. It comes through the process kind of at every corner. And then the, the second thing with that is that I think a great measure of, of good art is to tell a story that only you could tell, that uh, only your voice could tell quite in that same way. And so whenever I can, especially with passion projects, because as you know, like making an income and doing projects out of passion can sometimes be different. and I'm not always endlessly curious or constantly learning through some of the commercial work I do, but that's just part of the balance of needing to make money versus needing to make art. And hopefully those will intersect more and more. You mentioned like the medium and how important that medium is. And so I think that's a good transition to like the filmmaking elements. I'd, I'd personally just love to hear about the process too of scouting the aerials or capturing them. Uh, I knew that I wanted to do a project like this I think since sophomore year of college and I applied twice and then the second time the university approved to give me some funding and that funding was similarly it was just enough to cover my my flight my car rental some food and some equipment I had enough money to rent a car but not enough to have consistent lodging so what we did is um, I used part of my my budget to rent some camping gear and we, we just slept in the rental car for those two, two, two of those three weeks. I was a little nervous because two of my interviews were canceled. I, uh, I hadn't heard back from a lot of contacts that I had just sort of cold emailed. And so by the time I was, I was there the first few days, I only had one interview locked down. Mm. Um, and that was with this uh, professor of, of uh, history and folklore. And after that first interview, sort of the, it became a, a snowball and she introduced us to some of her colleagues in other departments. Uh, and I, I just followed every thread that I could. And every time someone suggested somebody else to talk to, I would reach out. And I think one thing that also helped was that uh, I, I had sort of the strict constraint for myself that I wouldn't show people's faces. And it wasn't, it had nothing to do with anonymity, but more just I wanted to see if I could pull off a documentary without talking heads. And then also I knew that people would feel more comfortable speaking with us if it was just a microphone and us talking face to face without the apparatus of a camera sort of wedged between us. And I'm glad I did that because I think it, people who appeared very camera shy and really you know, had no interest in being portrayed still could voice what they do. And, and then every time we interviewed someone and they expressed something that I got interested in, I would make a like, note of like, okay, what could we use to like visually represent that? And if not literally, metaphorically enough so that it would like, you know, translate. I wanted to ask you a little bit about your process and how um, being both in the director's seat and being someone who's familiar with cameras and, and the actual tools. Yeah. 
I, I do each role separately quite a bit and then also together. And it really depends on the project because I really love directing and shooting stuff when it's like, when it's in nature or through some amazing experience where we're really like diving into the nitty gritty with the tiny crew. Because I think a lot for me is exploring the world through a camera and exploring that environment through a camera and my excitement just kind of comes through shooting it is when it's a character driven story and you really want to make that person feel comfortable and feel vulnerable and just have a mind on what they're saying and what we're doing as opposed to just what looks kind of pretty cinematically. It's really helpful to have a co-director. And so that's why, or, or a producer that's really on your side as well. But, and so well, what I would say is that I think from my experience, directing and shooting is a really great way to be incredibly invested in the film and part of every moment of the process and you're making all these decisions that are kind of pairing visuals with character moments or with landscape moments that you couldn't quite do kind of working with someone else but at the same time either separating them or having a co-director is really helpful for like vulnerable personal stories i keep trying to grow away sometimes from always shooting stuff because i want to get better at just directing and communicating that vision um, to someone, but especially with small crews, like it's such a fun way to be a part of the process. And I like, grew up with the camera in my hand and all that sort of stuff. So that's actually, yeah. Cause and one of the questions that, uh, that Nifty put forth was how do you approach projects that are visually focused on nature differently than ones that are on human subjects? As you said, the, the nature is this very important backdrop to the human story when, you know, sometimes you need to focus on creating that space and that's a much more abstract process of just being as you said a friend more than just like an observer or a filmmaker or whatever else you just have to like be present and just be there face to face but then obviously the movie doesn't get made without that hyper technical understanding of of what needs to be where when you need to set up what you need to get done charged backed up everything and so it, it's tough because sometimes yes you, you find yourself roped into more of one or the other and when you're thinking mechanically you can lose sight of how it all works together you forget what's actually possible and like make happen with whatever your limitations are where you are who you have access to it's 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 a balance but i think that they both inform each other so much like it's it's such a, a beautiful way to complement those two skill sets because how can you really have a an executable vision if you don't also know how that vision can be executed? The way I think of it is my brain and my effort is like a pie chart and you're filling it up with needing to focus on cinematography or needing to focus on the mechanics or battery life or cards or XYZ. Then you're also focusing on the directing side and then just the human side of how do I make this person comfortable? And then like the, the large kind of macro side of what what left do we need you know what are we shooting how's our coverage and so i think when you're directing and shooting sometimes that pie chart kind of starts filling up pretty quick but once you get more comfortable with it for mm -hmm. certain projects that just becomes worth it for kind of the intimacy it creates with your style of shooting and then for others you might just want to focus one way or the other because as we i think we both know like directing is its own beast shooting is its own beast and combining them takes a lot of a lot of brain power and isn't always the best product. So it's just all situational, mm. you know? And budget and crew. Like I think both of us created projects that had almost no money. <laughs> you you were camping, you know, we were using all of our gear for free and stretching our yeah. budget for that one rental car. And so it's just like you don't always have the luxury. So it's nice to be able to do both. And you know, anybody listening to this uh, feels discouraged by like the lack of having a budget or access to specific resources. It's like, it's always just, I think about making the most of what you have and documentary is like a crash course in that because it's, you have to be much more reactive than I, I think in narrative work. And I actually, well, and I also wanted to ask you some questions about your thoughts on on like ethics. Yeah, the like morality of, of, of being responsible for someone's story and, and how you, how you approach subjects and maintain relationships with them after the fact. I think with the Maggie film, it's a, a very empowering film that doesn't mince words or dive into honestly much personal conflict aside from just wanting to take some space and reflect. And so 
I think in that sense, it was a bit easier for us to navigate the ethics, especially since she was reviewing edits. She was giving notes with us. And so that's not something you, you honestly rarely want your subject in your edit giving you notes. But in that case, it worked really well. We wanted her thoughts. And yeah, I think the ethics of all this is really tough. Something we spoke about earlier was creating that kind of symbiotic relationship with subjects where people want to share their story and want to be given a platform. And it's really empowering, I think, for them to share what they're doing and for you to lend that ear and lend those resources. And what's tough is the documentary filmmaking and narrative and filmmaking in general, um, even if your intent when making it isn't to make money, I think that it, it technically is and often is a profit kind of making medium um, and exposure making. And like you create these stories because you want people to see them. And so there's this really intense responsibility of those stories of how are you portraying someone, how are you portraying their vulnerabilities, and are you using that kind of vulnerability you built with them through the shoot towards your own gain or towards making a profit or, you know, towards some issue. But at the end of the day, it's really like their life and their story. And are you taking that agency from them? And so they're huge questions. I love the word expectations, both in the branded world and the doc world of setting expectations with someone for what you're doing. You know, don't go in and say, I'm making this documentary when really it's like a pharma ad, you know, or don't go in saying, I'm going to create a really perfect, shiny portrait of you when you're really trying to dig into some vulnerable stuff and expose them for something. Just make sure people are on the same page. Make sure they know why you're making this film, what you're making this film for, what your intent is, and kind of what your mission is or what story you want to tell. And I feel like that's a good route towards at least like starting what's a more like equitable conversation about um, what you're doing, what you're doing with your story, and especially on the back end, you know, like are you making a film for that organization and then you're going to use it for your own benefit and not give it back to them or let them screen it or find ways. And so I think that it's just like, as a filmmaker, you have to think through that whole process from development and especially through the distribution of how is this person betrayed? Do they understand they're being betrayed this way? And then what are kind of the ethics of distributing this film, both in terms of profit making and impact? Um, and what am I getting out of this? Like, I think as artists, we have really pure intentions making a lot of this stuff, but sometimes it's also kind of it's an intermix because we're also pushing our careers. You know, we need exposure. Uh, we need to make money on things to survive and eat. So yeah, broad answers to an even broader question. But in my experience, it's on a per project basis. The empathetic thing to do is to, you know, treat every subject with that same grace and respect of like wanting to depict them in, in a truthful way. And that's always tricky too, because obviously truth unfortunately is more subjective than we would care to admit and you can't remove your own biases from 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 the art making process so the ethics comes in with whether you're purporting it to be the truth about a certain subject matter and how thorough were you in your investigations um so yeah you, you i guess keeping yourself in check surrounding yourself with people whose opinions you trust and and not just having you know, yes people. Though I, I found that I haven't encountered too many, fortunately. I think most people are pretty honest about what does or doesn't um, work for them when you when you share. Yeah, so I think that's key, is having some fresh eyes that can always sort of help you keep sense of where you are and, and how you're depicting something. Because obviously you are approaching it with greater context than anyone else who will likely watch your work. So you, you need to put yourself in the shoes of, of people who don't know as much as, as you do by the end of, of the process.